Welcome to another Thankfulness Thursday as we continue to sort of meet together in our own homes and, and to try to pray together uh, using Dr. Fleming's book, If My People. We're going to continue to think about uh, revival and what is revival and Dr. Fleming is going to share a few thoughts with us on that and as well through this psalm that I want to read as we begin our time uh, this evening or this morning or this afternoon, whatever time that you're, you're watching this. So let me share God's word with you. This is Psalm 126. This is the word of the Lord. When the Lord brought back captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Amen. Dr. Fleming is going to use that psalm in a number of moments as we think together of well, really telling us what is revival. And I hope it'll be beneficial to you as we continue to pray as a people that the Lord would pour out his spirit into our lives more and more and that he would do a work in the lives of the people around us. You know, we've come to know the Lord in our own hearts. We are those captives who have been brought home to Zion, home to the Lord. Uh, and our hearts rejoice, but we want to see that happen for other people too. Uh, we want the Lord to pour out his spirit, because only he can open the eyes of the blind. He's the one who opened our eyes, and he's the one who can open the eyes of our family, our friends, and the people around us. So we want to pray that the Lord would do that. Again, that the Lord would, wouldn't visit us in judgment at a time like this, but that he would pour out his spirit and bring uh, a hope of revival in the Lord Jesus especially at a, a week like this when we think about Easter, we think all that the Lord has done for us in, in his death and his resurrection and pouring out his spirit into onto all flesh, as it says in Acts. So what I want to do is I want to pray, then we'll think a little bit together. And let me encourage you to pray um, at home, whether it be the afternoon or the morning or the evening, whatever time you're watching this, just to, to, to spend that time in prayer when we have this opportunity. So let me pray and you can join with me. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you today for your grace to us in the Lord Jesus. That he died and rose again. And in rising again, he sits at your right hand. That he's poured out uh, the spirit on all flesh. And Lord, your spirit has made us alive to know you and to love you. Your spirit makes us alive to want to follow you and love you more. And Lord, we know that your spirit makes us alive to trust you. Lord, that that happened for the first time for many of us a long time ago. But Lord, that you're still doing that today, helping us to follow you. And Lord, opening eyes for the first time. So Lord, we pray for revival. Lord, we pray that you would revive our land. Lord, that you would revive us. Lord, that you wouldn't make us self-righteous, that you wouldn't make us high and mighty, but that you make us humble. And Lord, that we would humbly desire that those that we love would come to know you the way that we know you. So Lord, even as we think today, as we spend this little time meditating on your word and, and the thoughts that you've given us, Lord, we just pray that you would work in this time, in our own hearts, in our own lives and in our own prayers. Lord, that you might hear and answer in your grace and mercy in Jesus. For we ask these things in his name and for his glory alone. Amen. Chapter three. What is revival? The term revival is often used to describe different events. During the last century, some have used it to indicate a planned time of evangelism. When the church or certain persons uh, attempt special work for the conversion of sinners. It has been used historically to indicate a divine visitation when God works directly to purify his people and save sinners. 
The accounts of revival which took place over the centuries are recorded with this understanding. It is only on rare occasions that revival has come in the context of organised evangelism. We now use the term in a historical sense of a divine visitation. These two events are approached in, very different, in a very different way. For evangelistic efforts, there are plans and organisation. It may be a local church or a citywide campaign. It is advertised, prepared for by a committee, special music chosen, individuals invited to give testimony and community visited and many invited to attend. An evangelist is chosen and he becomes a central att attraction. Revival cannot be organized. It is God visiting his people and he becomes the center of attraction. Thank God for evangelistic campaigns. We have no desire to downgrade them. But it is essential that we recognize how they differ from revival. Such campaigns have been used by God to bring many to an acceptance of Christ as Savior. God intended his church to use this ministry for he has given the office of an evangelist. He has raised up many for a task and blessed them to the salvation of great numbers of people. But this twofold use of the term revival is unfortunate because it has led to confusion. And the outcome has been that that people have ceased to pray and expect a divine visitation in revival. They no longer think it can happen and are frightened by false fire. Others have been put off evangelistic missions and crusades by assuming that they are attempting on a human level to create the emotion and conditions that were often found in revival. Since this twofold use of the term revival can lead to confusion, a clear definition or understanding is essential. Revival is a time of refreshing and renewal for the people of God, which leads to the work of saving grace for many. It is a remarkable pouring out of the Spirit to cleanse the people of God and issues a noticeable advance of the kingdom by the salvation of sinners. It is a quickening of believers and the regeneration of sinners. The influence and power of the Holy Spirit are granted in greater measure on some occasions than they have than would be normal in the life of the church. Then the sovereign power and the working of God are most clearly experienced. The Spirit has been given to convict of sin. Revival begins with the profound sense of sin and awareness of the holiness of God. He is present with his people. You know, at a time like this, I suppose we have an opportunity to do things a little bit differently. Dr. Fleming's here talking about the fact that um, often we confuse the term revival and evangelism. We, we kind of interchangeably use them or think they're kind of synonyms for each other. And he's saying it's not really maybe a good way to think about it. Revival is something often that happens in a strange way and in a way that it's really of God that man hasn't planned it. I suppose we've got a sense to pray that God would do that now for one simple reason. We have lots of evangelistic organisations. We have lots of things that would go on normally in the life of the church here in Abbot's Cross. Do we have our organisations? We have GB. We have uh, ES uh, Youth and ES Junior. We have Sunday School. We have Cup and Chat. We have uh, Food Bank. And you, we have a whole load of evangelistic organisations. We try really hard in those evangelistic organisations to, to spread the news of the gospel. And we're called to do that. It's a really, really important thing. But where we find ourselves now is all those things have been taken away. <laughs> we can't do them. We're not allowed to do them. Even food bank, we have to do it in a much more uh, simplistic way. We don't get a chance to, to have much chat or talk. So this is the time where, where, where we understand when those things are taken away, we really need the Lord's help to revive and do the work of evangelism. We need the Lord to work in a, in a, 
in a much more profound way because all the means that we have from a man-centered point of view, well, we don't have. What do we have at our disposal? Well, pretty much a camera and ourselves. Now, I, I'm going to say, I don't, I don't think the, the camera or what I'm doing is, is very significant, to be honest. I think the Lord can use it. The Lord can definitely draw straight lines with crooked sticks like me. But the most important thing that the Lord can do is pour out his spirit and pour out his spirit on our land and, and across its people and use us. And that when he pours out his spirit into our lives, we can see that overflow into the lives of other people. And that's a much more organic thing. It isn't an organized and controlled thing. It's something that the Lord's doing. So I want to pray that the Lord would do that. That, that we would be in some ways comfortable with the idea that our organizations have been taken away. That the, the sort of structure has been lifted off. We want to pray that the Lord would fill uh, the void with things that are from him. That we in our own lives would take the time to grow to know him more, to love him more and to, to see the opportunities that we each have to, to share the grace of the Lord with the people around us. I know so many of you are doing that and have the opportunity to do that. So what I want to do is I want you to take some time now to pray. To pray for revival in your own life and in your own heart. That the Lord would pour out his spirit into to your life. And again, I want you to pray that the Lord would place into your mind those opportunities that you have to share his grace with the people around you. The opportunities in the small ways, not maybe the planned and controlled ways of evangelism, but that the Lord would use you in just your daily life right now, in all the interactions, however limited they are, that he would take and use them and give you those opportunities to share his grace and his love with those people so take a moment to do that i'll pray now that to help you that that, that the lord would use this time for you to do that and, and we'll continue to think together so let me pray our father in heaven i want to pray now that wherever folks are listening to this lord that that you would come by your spirit and start to speak into their lives lord to show them the ways that that you want them to grow in their love for you in their knowledge of you and their service of you. Lord, I pray that you would take their prayers and use them for your glory, that you would visit us with divine grace that comes only by the power of your spirit. Lord, be with us and bless us as your church, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Fleming goes on to say this. For many a church and many an individual Christian, spiritual life has become clogged up. The ash of sin and worldliness needs to be removed. This is exactly where revival begins. The Holy Spirit leads to brokenness and repentance and then fans the spiritual life into a great flame. A few thoughts arising from Psalm 126 will illustrate the experiences of revival, where Israel celebrates her wonderful return from captivity, and as she prays, she anticipates the blessing God will give to his people. So this is Dr. Fleming's reflection on this psalm. Revival ends their captivity and is like a wonderful dream. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. You know, we're all captive at the moment, captive in our own homes. And uh, I think that day will be like a wonderful dream when we're finally released from our homes to be able to see each other again. But that's just a little taste of the captivity that, that, that we've been under as sinners. You know, when we're brought back to the Lord, we find ourselves brought back to our true home. You know, Augustine said that our hearts are never at rest until they find their rest 
in the Lord. He's our true home. He is, he is Zion. He is the place of our refuge and our help. Second thing Dr. Fleming says is this revival produces great joy and praise. Our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. You know, when the people were brought back uh, to Zion from their captivity, they'd been away a long time, a generation, in fact, more than two generations. And when those people first returned, they, only very few of them knew uh, what life was like before. And it produced in their lives great joy and praise. It's what the Lord produces in the lives of those he revives, joy and praise. We find not just our true home, but we find joy and peace in our true home that we're known and loved by the creator God. And that brings us joy and great praise. Three, revival is God doing great things for his people. The Lord has got done great things for us and we are filled with joy. You know, the Israelites experienced that in a really physical way. I'm sure we'll experience that in a physical way when we get to return to be a church together and meet with one another again. Um, pretty sure there'll be a lot of hugs going around uh, and that'll be a great time of joy. But we're looking forward to that, that Zion where, where joy will be manifest, where we'll see our saviour, when we'll be filled with joy because we'll say the Lord has done great things for us because he saved us. And that even as we think about Easter, we think about all the joy that the Lord has given us as his people. He has done great things for us. What has he done? He's given us his son. His son that would die on a cross to save us from our sins. That's, that's cause to rejoice. The Lord has done great things for us. Number four, revival touches the unsaved so they will know that God is at work. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. You know, the nations in this psalm, the nations are able to look and say, God's really done something for those people. But the hope of the hope of the gospel is that people who don't know the Lord would say, the Lord's done great things for those people, but I wonder if he could do that for me. And the answer is yes. You know, this psalm points to the fact that nations here are looking at the Lord's people and saying, the Lord's doing great things for them. But the hope of the New Testament and the gospel is that that, that God is not just God of Israel. He is God of the nations. You know, we're the Gentiles who have been brought in. You know, we want people to recognize that the Lord hasn't done just good things for us, but that he can do even more things for them. You know, the Lord saved us. He can rescue our neighbors. We want them to see not just the good that the Lord's done in our lives, but the good that he can do in theirs. Number five, revival produces a praying people. Restore our fortunes, O Lord. You know, the psalmist turns back to the Lord himself saying, Lord, you've already done great things, but Lord, restore our fortunes, make us great. You know, we can, we can ask for greatness in the kingdom. Greatness not for our own pride, but greatness in the fact of knowing our God more and more. Number six, revival creates Christians with a passion for the unsaved. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow. You know, the metaphor changes to a, to a farmer uh, sort of sowing seed in devastated ground. Um, sowing where there's lament for the things of the past, but looking towards a future. You know, we look towards a future where the Lord can do greater things than, than we think. You know, we're coming out of this uh, quarantine, all the things that have gone on, there's going to be hard times. And there's going to be economic problems when, we're, when we finally get back to all things. There's going to be a time where it's going to be hard. But we know that even in that, those hard things, even when we sow in tears, we, we know that the Lord can bring about goodness. And that's the last thing that, that, he, that Dr. Fleming says. Revival brings many sinners to saving faith in Christ. So those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. You know, it's that idea of an abundant harvest, that the Lord has given a harvest to his people. 
And that's what we want, not for ourselves, but for the Lord, uh, that we would see our land revived with his grace and with his mercy. So what I want to do, you to do in this last time is just find a Bible, open that psalm, and go through those lines and just pray whatever the Lord prompts you to do through, through that line of that psalm. It may be something short. It may prompt you, to, prompt you to pray something long. What I would just want you to do is to use God's word to feel your prayers. You know, we're told that the spirit works in the word. And as Luther was asked by his barber, how should he pray? Luther wrote him a wee track and basically taught him a way to pray was, was basically to take the scriptures and to pray back and to use the scriptures as a prompt to pray the things that the Lord puts into our minds and into our hearts. So I want you to give that a go. I want you to take that Psalm, Psalm 126, and just go through it line by line and just pray. It can be simple prayers just through that Psalm. And, and I pray that the Lord would use that and build you up as you do it.